Hello, welcome to Fact and Suspicion. I'm your host, Dan, here with my co-host, Ben. Hello. And in today's episode, we're going to be discussing the Alfred plea. It's always fun. One of the prosecutor's favorite weapons. Oh, it is. It is. Well, maybe their favorite defense. Yeah. Right. Um, so we, we were talking about the Alfred plea a couple weeks ago when we were discussing Michael Peterson case again. Obviously, he entered one. And we were thinking maybe we should just have a case discussing the Alfred plea, where it came from, the history, and how it's used, how it's abused, things like that. Because it's it's a pretty interesting aspect of of uh, of our criminal justice system. When you system. think about it, it really is bizarre, right? It is, yeah. Being able to maintain your innocence while pleading guilty, while pleading guilty. right? It seems a little contradictory. Well, yeah. Let's let's just get to that. So the way the where, where this plea came from is in 1963, a man named Henry Alford was arrested and indicted on first degree murder in North Carolina. Now there were there were a lot of compelling witnesses. In this case, um, he had argued with the murder victim and uh, around the time of the murder, he had been, been seen leaving his home with his gun. Oh, so, you know, it, it may be circumstantial evidence, but it's pretty strong evidence. I mean, very, that's, that's fairly damning. Very compelling testimony as well. Right. I assume the person ended up dead shortly thereafter. Yes. The, the, it was the murder victim. And it was just shortly after he was seen leaving his home with a gun that, that the person ended up That'll dead. do it. Now, at that time in North Carolina, if you are found guilty of first degree murder in a trial where you've pled pled innocent, uh, they can uh, use the death penalty. They, or they had could the gas use chamber death at the time, didn't they? I, I'm not sure. It probably was the gas chamber. I think chamber. I remember reading an article where that he was avoiding yeah. the gas chamber. Um, I really didn't think about that. I didn't look up that aspect of. It. I know he was trying to avoid the death penalty. Uh, now he actually, um, but however, if you were to plead guilty then they could not give you the death penalty. Okay. Uh, now, he found, or he felt that it was in his best interest to go ahead and plead guilty, even though he claimed he was innocent, because he felt like with the, you know, the testimony uh, of all these witnesses that he would be found guilty and would get the death penalty. And he didn't, obviously he didn't want that. Uh, now, they actually gave him a plea deal and he pled to second degree murder instead of first degree murder. Uh, but he maintained his innocence at the time. He said, you know, I didn't do this, but I feel like I need to go ahead and plead guilty. Um, now, after this, he was sentenced to uh, 30 years. And after that, he started thinking like, you know, I'm I'm in prison for 30 years. I can't get out of here. This is a problem. So he decided to appeal uh, and see if he get a new trial. And uh, it was a, b- a big problem to get a new trial on this because he had pled guilty. And, you know, he, he was trying to say that his plea was not uh, relevant, you know, because he was actually innocent. Uh, now, this went back and forth all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, and the Supreme Court decided that you could maintain your innocence and plead guilty if it was strategically advantageous so to like you. in your best interest? In your best interest. Yeah, mostly because of, uh, of overwhelming evidence right. of guilt. Uh, and, and that makes sense to me, right? But I mean, I would understand that like, if that's the only way you're going to avoid the death penalty, that you want to plead guilty and avoid that. Yeah, I get it. I get it. It's a shame that you would have to do that. Yeah. Um, but again, the Supreme court found that it was legal for him to plead that way and he could not get a new trial because he had pled guilty. Uh, and then he ended up dying in prison in 1975. Uh, now I'm not saying that Mr. Alfred was innocent. I know he maintained his innocence, but I mean, he, he may well have committed that murder. I mean, that doesn't uh, sound good. I mean, no, it doesn't. That, that's not much about the crime, of course. And Right. Um, I need I, more information, but yeah, not exactly. sounding good. That's not a, bad, it's not a, not a great start. Right. I, I didn't want to do I don't want to do like a deep dive right here into the whole case. Right. But uh, that's basically where the Alfred plea came from. It was actually a Supreme Court trial about this. Um, but it's really what it's become. What it's become. It's, 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 it's really abused nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a good example of that is what we're talking about with the Michael Peterson case, right? So um, I don't want to get into it because we've discussed Michael Peterson. We've at discussed length. the case. We've discussed the show based on the case, right? And, and you know, I'm not going to say he's guilty or innocent because there there is no good evidence either way. On this I have one. no clue. Well, we, yeah. We've probably discussed Michael Peterson more than any other person. Yeah, since we started this podcast, and I have no clue if he did it, right? But he was convicted of his wife Kathleen's murder in 2003. Now, he was later on granted a new trial, and that was because the uh, SBI, which is what they call their state 
uh, Invest- Bureau of Investigation in North Carolina, the SBI uh, analyst that analyzed the blood spatter in the case and was probably the prosecution's biggest witness. Dwayne Deaver. Dwayne right? Deaver, yes. Uh, it was found that... Uh, he was basically full of crap. Yeah. is basically what it was found. He um, lied about the number of cases he had done and the yeah, quality this, of the case. This was, I think, his second case, and he claimed to do 30, 40 yeah, was, cases. I, I think he's claimed like 80. Cases. Right. And he really he had no real training in blood spider either. He, he you know, just lying about his credentials. Uh, and he was found just to have been basically give false testimony any time just to get a guilty verdict right. for, for and for they, the they also uh, demonstrated somewhat convincingly that there was some sort of arrangement between the SBI and the prosecutor's office, right? Uh, well, between Deaver okay, yeah, and, right. and that particular prosecutor. Yeah, that's probably more fair. Um, but not really the SBI in general. And, and they didn't really prove an agreement as much as it just seemed that it seemed that he was willing to work with the prosecutor. Well, I mean, his, right? his methodology was yeah. just a total joke. He would basically reenact these uh, these crimes as many times as it took to get blood spatter that was remotely similar mm-hmm. and then claim that that was the definitive way it happened. But I mean, when you can change, when you're, con- when you control every variable, you're likely to get something similar eventually. Oh yeah, I mean, definitely. You, you adjust the force, the, the weapon. I mean, there's so many different variables you can, you can tweak to, to get the, the answer you're looking for. And when you're putting this guy's testimony up against Henry Lee, who is, you know, the premier blood spatter analyst in the world. Right. Um, and then this guy who but doesn't know what he's doing at all other than just trying to get a guilty verdict. Um, it makes sense that Henry Lee would know a little more about what happened. Right. right. Um, however, he, he was given a, a new trial and obviously, the prosecutors at that point, they knew his verdict was going to be overturned because this was the, the, the he was the main witness. He was right. their biggest witness. And I want to point out, because of the shenanigans with the SBI and some of the other issues with this case, while I have no clue whether he killed Kathleen, I can say pretty definitively that he was probably wrongly convicted. Right. They, they did not prove anything. They did no, not prove. There wasn't reasonable doubt in that case, and it doesn't exist. Exactly. Um, so... His his ver- his uh, guilty verdict was going to be overturned. Now, what they did is the prosecutors offered him an Alford plea. Uh, this was 2017. He had served 14 years at this point. And they let him plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter. And they were going to release him on time served. But he was able to plead guilty to that while maintaining his innocence. Because he did not want to say, I did this. He just said, I want to plead, you know make an Alfred plea to this manslaughter uh, charge so I can get out of jail. Right. Now, what this does for prosecutors is it means that he cannot sue the state now and for wrongful imprisonment. And they keep the W on their column. They do, yes. Um, and really, you know, someone that was in prison for 14 years and went through all this should be able to sue for wrongful imprisonment. Oh, I agree completely. And that also necessarily has the consequence of meaning... As far as the state's concerned, they had the right guy the entire time. So no matter how much evidence of guilt or of innocence there is, and the likelihood that there's probably someone else out there who committed the crime, they mm-hmm. stop looking. Exactly. Because to keep looking would be to admit... That you did something wrong. Yeah. And they don't want to admit they did something wrong. This is... I feel like it's just as much about pride as it is about, yeah. about the money. I um, mean, it's just, there's, there's a perverse incentive structure there. It really, uh, which really is, is why often... In these cases, like, say, with the West Memphis, West Memphis Three, or even to some degree with Peterson because of the documentary, um, you couldn't really get the gears of justice turning the right way until there was a certain level of public pressure, mm-hmm. until the pressure from the say, maybe the constituency of the prosecutor starts to outweigh the incentives that exist with inside the justice system, which effectively are just to uh, get the guilty verdict and to maintain it for life. Exactly. Yeah. That, and that's, that's a real problem with the fact that DAs are elected. Yeah. Like, like when you, when you're elected, no, some of someone, them are appointed to be fair. Some and, of them and, are. And I don't know if the prosecutor in his case was elected or, or appointed. I don't know that. I don't know. I'm pretty sure the state attorney general was elected. And I, I think in North Carolina, maybe the state attorney general points DAs. Okay. But there's still, you know, there's still politics involved. There's still a, yeah, there's a popularity involved. aspect no matter what. So you have to keep the public happy and you have to get those convictions to keep them happy. Right. So 
That's what happens. It, it, it's 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 terrible that this happens this way, because not only you know, like we said with Henry Alford, you know, he was facing the death penalty possibly. Uh, I'm not saying guilty or innocent, but you're using the death penalty to scare someone into pleading guilty. Well, I mean, let's be honest, and that happens all the time. Plea deals of all sorts are the effectively the lifeblood of the justice system, right? They are. No one really wants to go to trial. Well, I mean, it would be impossible. We accuse like. They, we accuse so many people of crimes that unless, you know, 80, 90, I think it's like 90% take plea deals, there simply wouldn't be enough time in the day to do all those court cases. No. We have to have those plea deals with the way our system is currently structured. No, that's, now, whether that's that so would true. mean, um, you know, cutting some laws uh, or maybe prosecutorial discretion, uh, maybe them using it more responsibly or taking it away entirely. I, I don't know. Are there any number of solutions there? That we could that we could try. Well, another issue with that is is public defenders basically they have to try to get a plea deal because they cannot handle their case. Hey, when you've got between thirty and seventy cases on your docket, like all you're trying to do is get these pled out as quickly as possible. Exactly. They go to the prosecutor. What deal can I get for this guy? Okay, how about this guy? And just turn the pages until it's all done and collect their meager sums. Yeah, because in the United States. Um, we will spend a lot of money putting you in prison, but we are unwilling to expend almost any to keep you from going. That is... There are serious flaws in our justice sad system. Sad, Of course, true. there are flaws in every justice system. No justice system is perfect, but... Ours is extremely flawed. Yeah. Extremely flawed. Now, to, to be fair to prosecutors, they do get it right most of the time. It's just simply for the fact that by the time, because most crimes, let's be honest, are obvious, right? Oh, There's not a lot yeah. of mystery for most crimes. But even the ones where there is a little mystery, usually by the time they go through the, the police, go through the investigation, it gets to the prosecutor, it's pretty obvious by that point. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's estimated that around 15% of state uh, inmates have entered either an Alfred plea or a no contest plea. I didn't know it was that high. Yeah, me neither. But, and, and essentially, they're almost the same thing, mm -hmm. I know. But technically, um, Alfred plea is different from no contest because in no contest, you're not maintaining innocence right. or you're not admitting guilt. You're just saying... It's a middle ground between... Middle them. ground. Just, I'm, I'm not contesting this. There's too much evidence. With the Alfred plea, you are pretty much proclaiming innocence. Now, legally, it. there's no difference between no. the two because well, if, if you're guilty, it, the, the guilty verdict's still going to be on your record either way. And that's yeah, part yeah. of the issue with the Alfred plea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some judges won't even accept an Alfred plea. Yeah. Uh, because they, they feel like, you know, you can't do that. You can't, you can't, it's, it's a judge's discretion as well, right? Mm -hmm. And in certain states, it's not, you can't even use one at all. But the judge usually... Well, I say usually in any case, a judge accepts an Alfred plea. They're going to ask you a lot of questions. If you understand that you are, you know, really pleading guilty to this crime, even if you're not, you know, even that you're not uh, admitting to the crime, that you will be treated as you're guilty. You will face the consequences of this guilty plea. Um, and, and they they make sure that you understand that. Right. Right. Uh, though, though when for, it's used, for the purposes of the law, you are guilty. Right. And, and now, even though it's used, you know, like like this with to really screw over a lot of people like Michael Peterson, like the West Memphis three, um, you know, that there are other cases where people well, actually, use there's it. an interesting case that I, I read about in the, uh, Oh, what maybe the, maybe in the guardian, uh, no, it was the Atlantic, the Atlantic, uh, where they looked at two, uh, two, two cases. Well, actually they were very re much related, but one of them accepted the Alfred plea and the other didn't. Mm -hmm. And just their life outcomes were, were completely different. Uh, it was the case of uh, James Owens. He was, uh, I don't know all the details, but he was convicted of killing a, a 26 year old woman. And the only evidence they had was the testimony of, of a guy named James Thompson. And, um, he had made up the story hoping to get the uh, the reward money. He turned in a knife to police officers, one of his own knives, and claimed that he had wiped the blood off of it, that he had found it outside of his home. And from there, uh, once police got him in the room, they ended up just using this guy as an information, like just, like he was their key information source. They needed him. And he ended up changing his story like eight different times. Well, because you have to, to fit with the facts. Right. And right? the defense never, never knew this, right? Mm -hmm. That this was kept from them. Uh, but eventually, 
uh, and this was before DNA testing. Eventually, DNA uh, exonerated both of them effectively. Mm. I say ex- I use exonerate loosely. Like it's obvious they didn't do it. Right. The courts uh, tried to drag both of them out, but James Owens insisted he was innocent. That they were both offered the Alfred plea. He refused to accept. And when they when they got to court uh, for their pretrial hearing. Uh, without saying anything beforehand, the state just dropped the charges. They they declined to prosecute. So he went home. Right. Uh, James Thompson, on the other hand, remember he had the confession. Right. It went the, that confession started with him implicating just Owens, but eventually they they talked him into implicating himself. There were pubic hairs found on the girl, mm. and he came up with this story about him about. Uh, and they said that the pubic hairs were consistent with his, right? Which mm. you know what uh, hair analysis was like oh, back then. Yeah. They just looked at it under a microscope. And if it looked similar, yeah. that was a match. And they said, well, you have to explain this. And his story was that um, while Owens was raping her, he was, let's say, pleasuring himself oh, right. behind her. And that's probably how his pubic hairs. Now, he, of course, he was making all this shit up. Right. He wasn't there, had nothing to do with the crime. And it went from trying to get a $1,000 reward to him spending, I think it was like uh, 20 years in prison. Oh, my God. And when he finally accepted it, uh, his life has just been, his life was just terrible thereafter. Right. He couldn't get a job. His family, he completely abandoned him. Um, and the outcomes for Owens were completely different. And that's just the difference of having a a felony on your record versus not, right? right? Was Owens able to sue for wrongful imprisonment? Do you know? So um, his, he sued a couple times. Most of them have been dismissed. But a suit against the police officers involved in the case, I, th- I believe the ones who interrogated Thompson, mm-hmm. that's going to trial sometime either this year or next. So we don't have the, the final outcome of that one. Uh, we don't know yet, but I hope he gets some compensation. Oh, I, I really do. Because there is no, like, we even, the, the Atlantic even interviewed some of the people involved with the case, and they knew that Thompson was lying. But what they said was, well, we knew he was lying about some things, but we thought he was telling the truth about these specific things, all the things that it just so happened they needed to get a conviction at trial. Right. Um, I hate cases like that, but that's really interesting that, you know, one took the Alfred plea and one didn't. Yeah. And, and their lives have been completely different. Since. Right. Though, honestly, uh, with Mr. Thompson, you know, it may have been more difficult for him to to have it overturned because he'd actually had a confession. Right, right. See, that was part of the problem. That's mm. why he didn't get out immediately. Yeah. Well, the, the, the two processes happened, like, I think they were like three years apart, mm-hmm. uh, just because he had that, <laughs> that awful confession on his record at the time. Right. And, you know, they had to rely just on his testimony and, you know, the the uh, fiber analysis for the other guy. But for him, they had that confession, mm-hmm. even if it was obviously untrue. And these are just sort of the links that some prosecutors will go to to keep people behind bars, just to keep their W, to keep from the shame of having to admit they made a mistake. Well, you know, a lot of it starts with the police investigators who, who got that confession, right? I, I mean, do you think they knew that this was false since time, or do you well, think they just... from interviews the Atlantic did, it seems that they knew he was lying about something. Right. Now, whether these were just certain cognitive biases had kicked in, or whether they were being dishonest, who knows, right? But, hey, we'll never know, because in these cases, uh, neither the prosecutors or the police involved ever face any ramifications. Never. Even if the defendant eventually gets compensation from the state, there will be no punishment from the prosecutors or the cops who had a, who played a role in it. No, I, I think you should definitely be able to sue the prosecutors and the police officers. Well, who... See, the one of his that was dismissed was against the prosecutor, but he was found to have immunity. Hmm. Yeah, I don't like them getting immunity. And I understand if they make a legitimate mistake. Right. right? And sometimes I think prosecutors have been misled by police investigators at times as well. But not telling the defense that your that your star witness had changed his story right. eight separate times. No, you have to reveal stuff like that. Come on. That's, that, that, I mean, I would consider that exculpatory evidence. And here's the thing. he uh, Sometimes I wonder what juries are thinking, right? But he told two separate stories on the stand. He told one story. And then the prosecutors had a discussion with him, and this is when he confessed to being part of it. So he got on the stand the first time, said, I had nothing to do with it. It was just Owens, and got on the stand the next time and said, yeah, I lied about that. I was involved, too. 
And juries just have this thing. It's like the average person imagines that there's no way anyone would ever confess to a crime that they didn't commit, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's why Ryan Ferguson was put in prison, right? Because God. his friend said, we did it. Right? His quote-unquote friend, his, his acquaintance. Quote, right, his acquaintance. acquaintance. Yeah. Right. Juries just have such a hard time believing that anyone could ever admit to a crime that they didn't commit. Right. I understand that. But at the same time, you have to understand the people that generally are coerced into these confessions are not very bright. No, in fact, uh, uh, Thompson had uh, some sort of traumatic brain injury uh, oh. several years before this. So that might have had something to exactly. do with it. Exactly. And I would say that anyone who decides they're going to just turn someone in, that they don't even you know know if he's guilty or not, have no clue, probably knows he's innocent just to get some reward money, probably not the you know, sharpest crayon well, in the box, uh, right? To, to, to be fair, and this is, I, to, to, I'm, I'm trying to be as generous as possible, right? He didn't immediately implicate Owen. He wanted to just turn the knife in, say, that I found this, and right. get his reward money. But they kept pressing him and kept mm. pressing him, and he didn't want to admit to lying. So eventually he implicated Owens, uh, who had worked at a gas station with him, and I think Owens had accused him of stealing, and he ended up getting mm. fired. And right. this, so he was like, "Well, if I, I don't want to be like, I don't want people to think I'm a liar, even though I'm clearly lying. So I'll just implicate this guy who accused me of stealing." Right. That's how that started. Right. So he didn't initially implicate Owen, but the second they pressed him, he accused an innocent man of a, 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 a horrific rape and murder. Rather than say, okay, I made all this up. Yeah, right. Uh, we don't want to get too deep into that particular case. but That uh, was just one example yeah. of where a an Alfred plea uh, had been offered to two people involved in the same case where one took it and one didn't, and their life outcomes had been completely different. Right. Um, there's another case of an Alfred plea that I found pretty interesting is that um, Pac-Man Jones made an Alfred the plea. The football player? Yeah, Adam Jones. Uh, anyone doesn't know he's a, a star cornerback in the NFL. Um he uh, ended up getting suspended over these charges. However, he um, he pled guilty with an Alfred plea while maintaining his innocence to obstructing a police officer. I did not know that. Right, and what he did is I'm not sure what was going on with the officer if they just like pulled him over. What exactly happened? But I know that Jones like tried to throw a punch at him and then bit the officer's hand. So. <laughs> Allegedly. I mean, allegedly. Let's be honest. That does not sound out of character for Pac Man Jones. No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. Uh, so, well, very little would sound out of character for Pac Man Jones. I'm assuming, though, the reason he used an Alfred plea was because he's a you know a public figure. And Maybe he it looked to, better with the NFL. Yeah, it looked better with the NFL to say, I'm, I'm innocent, but I'm going to plead guilty to this because it's in my best interest, right? Um, but th there's just another example of how it's been used. Like, this is used so many different ways. I can't imagine the NFL would care very much, like the because once the media attention's on it, like they take the hit either way. Exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't seem to make a difference. But maybe just you know, it, sometimes it's pride. Sometimes maybe he thought you know it'll look better be the public image, whatever. Um, I don't think his his biggest fans. I doubt they cared one way or the other. I if mean, he, if they didn't care about the other shit he did. Exactly. I mean, yeah, because he he was. Like, what, do you know what year this was? I, I don't remember what year it was. I have to look was it, it up. Before, was it during his football career? It, yeah, it was during. Okay. Yeah, he, he he was suspended over the charges. So. I'm not sure if he ever made a comeback after that or not. I think he did. But, uh, yeah, well, it that was, must it have was, been towards the end of his it career. It was later. And if career. you were still a Pac Man Jones fan by that point, yeah. that was probably very little that was going to change your mind. We should do an episode of him sometime. He was an interesting character. I don't know if NFL. he's quite in our wheelhouse, but. There are some NFL cases we could do. Oh, uh, Hernandez. Yeah, Aaron Hernandez. That's a rough one. We could do the uh, the death of, uh, oh, what was his name? The Titans quarterback. Um, oh, uh, oh, McNair. No. Uh, yeah, Steve, Steve McNair. McNair. Yeah. The or, death of uh, Steve McNair. Was it Lynn Byes, the, uh, the basketball player who uh, was supposed to go number one overall and ended up uh, oh, dying yeah. of a drug overdose? Yeah. Yeah. That was, that's, that's another really interesting one. There, there's a lot of stuff. We, we could do the, um, well, no, let's, let's stay away from that one. This wanna... is probably a conversation yeah. we should be having off, have there, off anyway. there. But yeah, there, there are some interesting NFL cases. We could do one of those. Uh, at any rate, though, that's, that's kind of like what the Alfred plea boils down to. It's In high profile, it, it's used to, to screw over people that were wrongly convicted. Right. Uh, however, I mean, it, it is used for other reasons. There, there are a lot of times people just want to maintain their innocence. Yeah, I mean, th there are some legitimate uses for it, but at least the more prominent uses of it 
have uh, have been just travesties egregious. of justice. Egregious. Where people are clearly innocent. And for the for for seemingly no other reason than to prevent being sued, rather than just letting them out of prison, dropping the charges, admitting they made a mistake, well, you plead to this and we'll let you out immediately. Mm-hmm. And some of the, the the ways that prosecutors force people into these pleas, um, like with uh, with Thompson, for example, uh, when he he was eventually going to fight, he was he was actually going to fight it as well. But they kept pushing his hearing back and back and back and just making him rot in prison. Mm-hmm. And eventually, he said, "No, I, I I have to leave." Right. And you know, and that's that's kind of the gun that prosecutors, particularly somebody who's already admitted to it, right? Mm-hmm. They're in prison. You know, the prosecutors have the time is on their side. Yeah. And they can weaponize that, which they frequently do, unfortunately. Uh, I think a good solution to this would be, you know, there should be a federal law that applies to every state, every jurisdiction, federally, state, whatever. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to do, but there should be something that if any sort of exculpatory evidence that could exonerate someone comes forth, then there should be a ticking clock on how long it is until they're released from prison and that how much money that state or that jurisdiction owes that person. Well, I don't know if that clock should start when the exculpatory evidence is found. Uh, well, well now may, maybe if, if the prosecutors were acting in good faith and right. they genuinely believed and there was no exculpatory evidence if they were hiding, but like if they hide evidence. Right. The clock should start back when they hear the evidence exactly. at that point. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish we had a more streamlined process for people who were wrongly convicted to a actually get out of prison and mm. b uh, get some form of compensation. Like right. I'm not saying we have to give every person who was wrongly convicted hundreds of millions of dollars, right? I realize tax uh, taxpayers are paying for this or fitting this bill, right? Right. But a, a good chunk of money for their pain and suffering. I mean, you cannot get back time. No, it would keep a lot of these you know wrongful convictions out. I think. Right. The, I, you know, I worry though that it would it would also tie prosecutors' hands in certain instances where they know someone's guilty. Like I'm not saying they just they know someone's guilty; they actually know they're guilty, but mm-hmm. they're having trouble proving it. Uh, we don't want to tie their hands in those kind of situations. But I mean, I, I'm a big fan of limiting of uh, limiting prosecutorial discre- prosecutorial discretion in general. Right. I think uh, with charge stacking and you know, like some of the stuff we were just discussing, like postponing hearings while someone's in prison, prosecutors have so much power. Uh, in just the ball is always in their court. Always, you know, because they're the federal or the state or federal employees, right? Um, they're basically on the same size as the judge. Yeah, they don't want to. They, they don't want to say that, but they are. You well, know? I mean, even when they're not in court, they're probably playing golf together. At yeah, the time, so. exactly. Like like these these prosecutors, they want to become judges. Oh yeah, basically, most judges I, I former think, prosecutors. I think I saw a statistic one time that like um, judge like uh, judges who were polled, I think like. 85% of them were prosecutors. I think they should make most, most of the judges should come from being uh, public defenders. Uh, maybe so. Cause they would at least make being a public defender worth it. They get paid so much less than prosecutors. Oh, have God. so much higher workload. Uh, it, it's, it's a shame. It really is. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the alpha. But we have any other points to make about it. Uh, I mean, I can't think of any, I think we've covered most of yeah. the important stuff. Um, very interesting, very, I would say it's overused uh, in a lot of different circumstances. I mean, even once is overused if you if it's a clearly innocent person. Oh, right? it is, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, like, it's used so much in, 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 in regular, you know, more cases than you would know. There's so only, many inmates that have made an Alfred plea. Because not only do they not get compensation mm-hmm. after they leave... Uh, after they leave prison where they never should have been in the first place. Mm. But now they have a felony on their record, which affects their earning potential and so many other life outcomes oh. just for the rest of their lives. Their whole lives. Yeah. And, uh, uh, usually because some prosecutor couldn't admit he or she was wrong. Yeah. Now in certain cases, like with Michael Peterson or <laughs> I, I say that, but we'll say the West Memphis three, they're so well known. I don't think the felony conviction really is affecting them as much. I, I don't want to say that with Michael Peterson, because I think there are a lot more people think Peterson's guilty mm-hmm. uh, than, oh, than yeah. West Memphis three. And my guess is in his hometown, uh, is it Durham? Durham, Durham, North Carolina. Yeah, it's yeah. even more ish there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I say it's pretty bad in Durham. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, yeah, that's, that is the Alfred plea in a, in a nutshell. I think we made a little over nutshell time, but yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, but it's interesting, interesting ordeal. I think we should uh, cover some more of these cases later, though. 
Yeah, uh, though, if, you, if you're watching and you're wondering when we're going to go back to actual cases, don't worry. That, that is the plan that, to get back to actually looking at you know, mysteries and such. But uh, we've been very busy and our, our schedule has been kind of limited. And this is something we've wanted to talk about right. for a long time anyway. And so. my kids are out of school, so it's hard for me to get stuff done. I need them to go back to school as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Well, thank you for listening or watching to Fact and Suspicion. If you enjoy our content, we'd love it if you would like, subscribe, leave a comment, leave a review, uh, tell a friend. We love it when you tell friends. Yeah. Hey, that is the, the best thing you can do. If you want to support the show, like telling people is the absolute best way you can do so. Right. And uh, we'd also love for you to leave a comment and suggest any cases you'd like for us to cover or mm -hmm. any true crime aspects, something like that. Uh, we like to cover different things. We are looking for new cases always. So again, thank you for listening. Good evening. Good night. Good day. Whatever it happens to be. See you thank next you. time.